In October of 2016, a strange phenomenon took place across North America. Sightings of evil clowns. Videos quickly began flooding the internet through various social media sites, most prominently Twitter, and all of them seemed to follow the same disturbing pattern. One person or a group of people would be walking or driving somewhere isolated, usually at night, when they would be confronted by someone dressed up like a creepy clown. The person recording these videos would either freak out and immediately run away, with the clown almost always giving chase, or confront the clown and yell obscenities at them before freaking out and immediately running away with the clown giving chase. Now, this wasn't the first time something like this had taken place. In 2014, there were similar incidents of people dressing up like evil clowns and walking onto porches in the middle of the night to menacingly stare into security cameras. However, the 2016 sightings were much more prevalent, and the public panic that came as a result was swift, especially given the obvious timing of these stunts just before Halloween. Local and cable news networks were discussing the sightings fairly regularly for most of October, and the anxiety over potentially dangerous clowns stalking their city streets had police on high alert. One precinct in Massachusetts even released this unfortunate ad to deter any would-be clowns from donning their masks. Hey, you the clown that was scaring the kids back there? Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. What are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about it? Huh? Tough guy. Huh? What? By yourself? It's not what I'm gonna do, it's what we're gonna do. Sounds like someone posting cringe. Now, in retrospect, the majority of these were very likely just bored teenagers pranking random strangers. One pair who were arrested were actually discovered to be a young couple who decided their relationship goals were standing on the side of a highway dressed as clowns and scaring people. Also, while I'm not one to suggest people would lie on the internet for something as insignificant as social media attention, there is a strong possibility many of these videos were staged. Shocking to think, I know. Staged or not, however, the impact these events had was pretty staggering, and one group that was impacted the most was clowns themselves. Professional clowns saw their bookings take a nosedive, with many of them condemning the stunts and accusing the ones responsible for perpetuating a negative stereotype about their art form. McDonald's, who had already been slowly limiting public appearances of their famous mascot Ronald McDonald, shelved him entirely, and as of the making of this video, has yet to return him to any of their promotional material. <laughs> The World Clown Organization, which is a 100% real organization that I promise I did not make up, also swiftly condemned the evil clowning, with their president Randy Christensen defending his profession in an interview saying, quote, We're full of people that love children, bring smiles, and want to help people laugh and bring comic relief. The people dressing up are trying to scare people. No professional clown would ever take part in anything like that. This hype only adds to people thinking clowns are scary. They need to stop scaring people. It's having a serious impact on us. Indeed, it seems that the general consensus these days is that clowns are creepy, weird, terrifying, and basically any descriptor you can think of that's the complete opposite of how Randy Christensen says clowns see themselves. Public opinion of the art form seems to be at an all-time low, and it wasn't even a century ago 
that some of the most beloved children's mascots were the likes of Ronald McDonald and Bozo the Clown. You're living in the past, man. You hung up on some clown from the 60s, man. Oh. Okay, fine. But this does beg the question, what exactly happened? How did we get here? And how did clowns become scary? To start, we need to ask ourselves an important question. What exactly is a clown and where did they come from? Google defines a clown as, quote, a comic entertainer, especially one in a circus, wearing a traditional costume and exaggerated makeup, with the date of their origin somewhere around the 18th century. But primarily, that definition is referring to these type of clowns. There are also silent clowns, royal clowns, and human shield clowns, several of which had a great influence on what we in the modern world think of when we hear the word clown, and their respective origins go back much further than the 18th century. The earliest examples of clowns in human history date back to the ancient world, as widespread as Egypt, China, Africa, pre-colonial America, and Rome. Each of these civilizations worshipped their own respective gods, and their pantheons often included gods or goddesses who were tricksters. These trickster gods were worshipped just as much as their much more serious colleagues, and one way rulers in the ancient world would pay worship to these trickster gods was to have clown-like figures whose role was primarily to serve as entertainment, a tradition that eventually evolved into the court jester of European monarchs. Modern interpretations of the court jester often portray a terrified servant, constantly in fear of his life if he slips up and says something that his king finds unfunny or offensive. But that viewpoint actually goes against much of what we know about court jesters and the role they played. It's important to remember that as the ruler of a massive empire, kings, pharaohs, and emperors were often surrounded by yes-men, or people who would play friendly to their face while quietly plotting to subvert them behind their back. And the court jester's job was essentially to give their ruler an excuse to sit back and laugh at themselves. It was not uncommon for jesters to poke fun at their monarch and say things that would have been punishable by a horrendous death were they to come out of someone else's mouth. There was even a rule throughout the kingdom known as jester privilege, where a court jester could publicly mock nobles and merchants without fear of being retaliated against. This status would be displayed via the cap with bells hanging off of it and the scepter they would carry around, which was known as a moret. Because of their unique ability to poke fun at their rulers through a veil of comedy and get away with it, court jesters often became a vessel for commoners to air some of their grievances at the royal family. That isn't to say the life of a court jester didn't have its dark side, though. Oftentimes, men who were selected for this role were picked for the job due to some physical defect that, in the minds of those within the royal court, made them easier to laugh at. This included physical deformities such as dwarfism and neurological defects such as Tourette's syndrome. There was also a belief in medieval Europe that people with these sorts of conditions had magical abilities, which, according to popular belief at the time, gave them greater insight into the world around them. One of the most famous jesters during this era of history was a man by the name of Tribulet. Tribulet suffered from microcephaly and was a court jester for French kings Louis XII and Francis I. Despite his condition causing severe developmental disability, Tribulet displayed a staggering level of wit and was widely regarded for his comedy that made him popular with both the monarchs he served. However, he also developed a reputation for pushing the boundaries of what he could get away with, even by the standards of a court jester. One day during a routine he was performing for Francis I, Tribulet walked over to the king and slapped him on his butt, much to the amusement of the nobles in attendance. King Francis, though, was not amused. He had Tribulet imprisoned and ordered his execution. 
A few days later, he calmed down and had the jester brought back before the court, telling him that if he could think of an apology that was more insulting than the act he had committed, he would let him live. The jester's response was, quote, I'm sorry, your majesty, that I didn't recognize you. I mistook you for the queen. This very likely took all of the air out of the room, as one very strict rule for jesters within the royal court was they could not under any circumstances ever joke about the queen or her ladies-in-waiting. Tribulet had quite literally taken the most sacred rule a jester was to live by and smacked it across its rear end. Francis I ordered Tribulet to be taken back to the dungeon to await his execution. However, the king still seemed to have a bit of a soft spot for his now former jester and eventually went to Tribulet and told him that he would allow him to select the manner under which he was to die. The ever-witty Tribulet replied, quote, Good sire, by St. Goody Two-Shoes and St. Fatty, patrons of insanity, I ask to die from old age. King Francis was so amused by the jester's response that he stayed his execution and instead ordered him to be exiled from France, where he would go out to live the rest of his life quietly before passing away at the age of 54. The role of the court jester diminished over the following centuries, with the tradition having all but disappeared by the 1700s. But the art form certainly left its mark on history and would go on to greatly influence not just clowns, but entertainers in general. While we can easily argue they were mischievous and in many cases pushed the boundaries of what they could get away with, I would stop short of calling jesters evil or even creepy. In fact, their historic reputation seems to be relatively clean, with them still being portrayed in the media as funny and sympathetic characters, unlike their clown cousins. So for now, I think we can file court jesters firmly into the fun category and move on to examining our next clown ancestor. Clowns weren't the exclusive territory of royal courts by any stretch of the imagination. They mingled among the people, took part in local festivals, religious events, and even funeral services. Clowns of the Pueblo people, a Native American tribe that populated a large part of the southwestern United States, used clowns in monthly rituals, calling upon the gods to cure the sick and ease tensions within their community. And I think it's safe to say these clowns were about as far from evil as it gets. I mean, look at this guy. How could you not love that face? Similarly, different versions of characters that broadly fit the clown archetype began appearing in theater productions starting in the 16th century. Originally, these were clearly based on the jester, but slowly evolved into something much more theatrical as the art form refined itself more and more. Nowhere was this evolution more pronounced than within the Commedia dell'arte, a form of comedic theater that originated in Italy during the 1500s. Translated, the phrase means comedy of the profession, and its basic premise was a group of masked performers who would take to the stage and perform comedic routines that were sometimes scripted and sometimes improvised. The cast would take to the stage in masks and elaborate outfits, and perform their routines for the eager eyes and ears of their audience. As I said, many of these shows were heavily improvised, but there were many aspects of the Commedia dell'arte that were planned out beforehand. One such example being the characters that were found within each of these shows. There are too many to list every single one, but they essentially boiled down to four archetypes. Il Capitano, a man who would always refer to himself as Captain, despite not actually being in the military, and would always try to impress those around him with over-the-top bravado and displays of masculinity, only for it to be revealed during the course of the show he was actually a coward. In a Marathi, a pair of young, attractive, and energetic lovers whom the story of the plays would often revolve around. Vecchi, a wealthy older man who more often than not would be the story's antagonist, trying to drive a wedge between the lovers, either because he was the female lover's father who did not approve of the relationship, or was simply trying to have her for himself and couldn't compete with the younger man. 
Lastly, and most importantly for our purposes, there was the Zani. Heavily inspired by the rustic fool characters of ancient Rome and Greek theater, Zani characters were often blue collar, who worked either as servants or laborers for the Vecchi. They had arguably the strongest survival instinct among the cast, being quick-witted and able to quickly navigate treacherous situations. This quick wit came with an impeccable sense of comedic timing. That often led to them being considered the funniest characters. Additionally, they were one of the only characters who could regularly break the fourth wall and address the crowd directly, leading to them more often than not being among the most popular characters in the show. There were multiple different types of Zani characters, but easily one of the most common was the Arlecchino, who would become known in English as Harlequins. The Commedia would grow in popularity over the coming century, and quickly began expanding outside of Italy to adoring fans in Western and Eastern Europe. Performances began to move further and further away from their home country. This resulted in an ever-growing language barrier that forced the performers to rely more on physical comedy. To call this a radical change would be a huge understatement. The Commedia dell'arte had always had its fair share of slapstick comedy, but the biting social commentary and satire that was layered within was a huge part of what made this form of theater what it was. Slowly but surely, it began to dwindle in popularity, as it shifted away from the style of comedy that made it famous in the first place, until eventually fading completely into obscurity. Despite dwindling in popularity, the influence the Commedia had on the contemporary arts was widespread and profound. Taking inspiration from their Italian counterparts, English theaters began incorporating more and more into their work from the Commedia, with some tweaks of their own. This eventually led to the creation of the Harlequinade, a form of theater similar to the Commedia dell'arte, but with some key differences. Whereas the Italian version had the Harlequin playing a popular background character, the English version made them front and center. The Harlequin Abe was also much more focused on physical performances, using everything from slapstick comedy to acrobatics to entertain their audiences. So strong was this commitment that early versions of this form of theater didn't even have speaking parts for their actors though this eventually changed as the decades wore on. Masks were often replaced with makeup, and the outfits for the Harlequinade were also a bit more flamboyant and elaborate than what had been used in the Commedia. With the Harlequin becoming the unquestionable focus of the narrative, he often took the role of one of the young lovers, and foiled the evil Vecchi's deeds at every turn. The problem was, though, their sly nature made them almost unchallenged within the story, and because they were supposed to be the hero, writers didn't want them to be made a fool of too often. Thus, theater directors began working on a concept for a new character to introduce to the Harlequinade, one who would act as a foil to the star of the show. What they settled on was a character that took the trope's rustic fool influence to an entirely new level. A character that, unlike the sly Harlequin, was a bumbling idiot who was as destructive to everyone else as they were themselves, and who would endure being the butt of jokes that the Harlequin was way too smart to ever get caught by. That character was the clown. Originally introduced in the late 1700s, the clown was portrayed as a vagabond, barely scraping by and almost constantly finding themselves in bad situations. Their intricate attempts to get out of these bad situations would almost always fail in a hilarious manner, much to the delight of the audience who was all too happy to laugh at the character's suffering. They usually worked directly with or were the antagonist of the story, and they became a beloved part of the Harlequinade almost overnight. As the years passed into the 19th century, the clown evolved more and more into the central comedic character within the productions, while the Harlequin became a much more romantic figure, who could still be funny, but was a lot more serious than his idiotic counterpart. These characters continued to evolve and grow further and further away from one another, 
but it was in the early 1800s where a man named Joseph Grimaldi would change the clown forever. Joseph Baptiste Grimaldi was born in London in 1788. His father, Joseph Giuseppe Grimaldi, had gained a moderate amount of fame as a dancer and actor in theaters all around London, going by the stage name Giuseppe. But he was also quite promiscuous and a creep, as indicated by his taste for underage girls. He met Joseph's mother when she became a dancing student of the 60-year-old Giuseppe at just 13 years old in 1773. Eventually, the two began a sexual relationship, which resulted in Joseph's birth five years later. Grimaldi would learn a great deal from Giuseppe in his younger years, and was basically groomed to be a showman from the time he was a young boy. He began performing alongside his father and three brothers when he was just two years old, and possessed an incredible talent for theater that quickly made him famous throughout London. Don't take this to mean that Giuseppe was a good father, though. He was often cruel to the young Joseph and his brothers. During performances, he would do stunts with them at such incredible force that his children often walked away with injuries, such as one time where he spun the four-year-old Joe around on a chain with such force that it ended up breaking and launching his son into the orchestra pit. At home, Giuseppe was a harsh disciplinarian, who would often beat his wife and children. So really the guy was just an overall terrible person. Despite his awful father, Joseph found his love for the theater only grew throughout his life. When he was still very young, he began performing with the Harlequinade. He learned almost every role within the theater group like the back of his hand, but the part he felt the most affinity toward was the clown. Grimaldi performed constantly at Drury Lane to the delight of audiences and critics alike. However, Grimaldi and his family soon ran into financial difficulties. Giuseppe was forced into retirement when Joseph was only nine years old, making the still very young child the only person in his household earning a steady wage. His brothers had been unable to find the success in theater that he had, and one even ran away to work on a shipping vessel, never to see his family again. Giuseppe died shortly after his retirement, and not content to traumatize his children only in life, requested that his estranged daughter Mary decapitate him upon death. His reason for this was in his later years, he developed an irrational fear of being buried alive, and wanted his children to make sure he was dead upon laying him in his grave. Grimaldi's salary was not enough to maintain the lifestyle his family had become accustomed to, and they were forced to sell their home in the fairly affluent city of High Holborn and move to St. Giles, one of London's many slum districts. This was of course a very jarring experience for Grimaldi and his family, who had lived a pretty comfortable life on their father's theater earnings. Joseph himself had been educated in a private school that specialized in theater, and they grew up eating good food and wearing fine clothes, all of which had come to an end when the family fell deep into poverty. The theater, which had been Joseph's place of comfort for his whole life, even became a source of stress, as his career faltered in his early teenage years. While it is absolutely insane to say that a teenager could be considered a has-been, the general consensus was that without Giuseppe's guidance, Joseph had lost much of the ability that had captured audiences in years past. It's almost like a 13-year-old boy shouldn't be solely responsible for his family's financial well-being. Not to be deterred, he continued to perform at theaters night after night. And although he endured a rough couple of years where he could only secure supporting roles, things finally began to look up for him around the time he turned 15. He began getting more important roles in the theater, often playing one of the backup clowns to the Harlequin. In 1800, he was once again given a chance to fulfill his beloved clown role, after getting a job at the Sadler Wells Theater, working under the very successful writer and theater manager Charles Dibden. Dibden and Grimaldi took the role of the clown to the next level. They were both of the mind that the Harlequin should be the leading man and play it straight leaving the majority of the humor and antics to the clown. 
Their collaboration was a massive success, and Grimaldi saw revitalization in his career, with his clown character becoming so popular throughout London that other theaters began copying the style of humor and costumes found in Dibden's plays. 1800 also brought tragedy to Grimaldi, as his young wife Maria died during childbirth, in which the child did not survive. Heartbroken, Joseph gave himself completely to the theater, often performing two shows a night. His career continued to surge, and soon he was earning enough money that his family was able to move out of the St. Giles slums. Part of what made Grimaldi so beloved was his unflinching dedication to his art. He would often perform very elaborate and dangerous stunts in the name of physical comedy and making his audience laugh. One such example was in 1801, when, during a stage performance, Grimaldi accidentally shot himself in the foot, leaving him bedridden for several weeks. During this time, he was cared for by a nurse named Mary Bristow, whom he quickly developed a romantic relationship with and married just a year later. At the end of 1801, Sadler Wells Theater was closed for remodeling, and when it opened back up in the spring of 1802, Grimaldi wanted to debut a new look for his clown character in celebration. He settled on white face paint with rosy red cheeks accompanied by red lip paint, a look that would go on to define the clown's appearance for the next 200 plus years. Grimaldi named this character Joey the Clown, and it became so popular with London theater goers that the local slang for clowns became Joey's. Grimaldi seemed to be on top of the world. He was arguably the most popular theater performer in London during the first part of the 19th century. He was earning a higher wage than his father ever had, and in 1802 his wife Mary gave birth to a son named Joseph Samuel Grimaldi. Like his father, Joseph Samuel, or J.S. as he was known, developed a love for the theater at an early age. Grimaldi encouraged his son to learn about the performance arts, but didn't want it to consume his childhood like it had for him. So he was insistent that J.S. go to school and not spend every waking moment in the theater. In his free time, Joseph Samuel did learn the art of theater from his father and became a proficient clown in his own right. By the time he was 12, J.S. started performing in plays alongside his father and the elder Grimaldi became convinced that his son was capable of having a solo career. As with everything else in Joseph Grimaldi's life though, things took a turn for the tragic. By 1812, the family started to once again suffer from financial hardship. His wife Mary had expensive tastes, which Joseph was probably a little too accommodating to. Grimaldi was also defrauded out of a large amount of money by some very unscrupulous accountants. This forced him to work more and more shows to keep his family out of bankruptcy, which took an awful toll on his body and left him with several injuries that would plague him the rest of his life. His relationship with his son had also become strained by the 1820s. The pair had performed together for several years, even going on a tour that was widely praised. But as he got older, J.S. felt that his father's fame was a burden, and in 1821 left home and publicly renounced any association with his father. At the same time, the injuries sustained throughout his career finally began catching up to Grimaldi. He fell into decline as his broken body could no longer perform to the level he had in years past, and his broken spirit over the destroyed relationship with his son caused his famous sense of humor to dull. The clown character that had brought so much laughter into the world was now an aging and broken man. With bills and debt piling up, he desperately tried to fix his family's financial situation, undertaking risky business ventures that all failed, leaving him on the brink of financial ruin. J.S. subsequently failed to get out of his father's shadow, and his solo career died before it could even take off due to his addiction to alcohol and prostitutes, making him a performer theaters could not rely on. He returned home to his parents in 1827, heavily in debt. Unable to secure his son work, and with financial troubles of his own, Grimaldi was unable to pay J.S.'s bills, 
leading to his son being incarcerated in a debtor's prison for three years. Upon his release, he continued to spiral out of control and died in 1832 at just 30 years old. Grimaldi's wife Mary would pass away two years later as a result of complications from a stroke she'd suffered just a few days before her son's death. Grimaldi would spend the rest of his life as a depressed alcoholic, barely surviving off what little money he had saved. On May 31st, 1837, he died of a heart attack and was buried in St. James Churchyard, with the garden he was laid to rest in eventually being renamed to Joseph Grimaldi Park. While his life had in many ways been hard and tragic, Grimaldi changed the art form of the clown forever. A very successful autobiography of his life was published a year following his death, which was a collaboration between George Cruikshank and Charles Dickens. It sold well and was a riveting look at the heartbreaking story behind the man who'd created Joey the Clown. The Harlequinade began losing popularity as the century progressed. The character of the clown, however, did not. And in the 20th century, the clown, much like the man who'd revolutionized it, would ascend to phenomenal heights and fall to tragic lows. By the turn of the 20th century, the clown had seen its success rise to new heights that even Grimaldi himself could have barely dreamed of. Artists who drew their influence from him had spent the rest of the previous century popularizing the clown as a fixture of theatrical entertainment across the world. Men like George L. Fox, who became known as the American Grimaldi, helped popularize the clown character in the States through his numerous Broadway appearances. Frank Oakley, known as Slivers the Clown, became a staple in the Ringling Brothers Circus and one of the most famous performers in the United States. However, much like their inspiration, Joseph Grimaldi, both of these men met extremely tragic ends. George Fox suffered several injuries throughout his career that left him almost handicapped by the age of 50. Additionally, his psychological state began rapidly deteriorating, possibly due to lead exposure from his face paint. This resulted in his behavior on stage becoming so erratic that it disturbed audiences. And in his last performance, Fox was literally removed from the stage by co-workers who feared for his sanity. He suffered a series of strokes shortly after that left him almost totally bedridden for the next two years, until he died at the age of 52. Frank Oakley took his own life when his mistress rejected his marriage proposal after he had bailed her out of prison for stealing his late wife's jewelry. There's a lot to unpack in that one. So it's easy to see how there was already this dark cloud floating over the character, with many of the most influential performers' lives being steeped in tragedy. That isn't to say this was the case for all of them, though. Charles Adrian Weddick, better known by his onstage persona of Grok, saw immense success during the early 1900s, and became known as the King of Clowns. He would perform to sell out crowds across Europe throughout the first half of the 20th century. Becoming so successful, he was one of the highest paid performers in the world, and was able to start his own circus in 1951. Unlike the others I've mentioned so far, Grok lived a very happy life, retiring in 1954 and enjoying the remaining years of his life living in a 50-room mansion in Imperia, Italy before passing away at 79 years old. So it isn't like the life of a clown guarantees a dark end. Of course, one of the most impactful events during the 20th century that affected not just clowns, but the entirety of human existence was the creation of the motion picture. This innovation would change how we consume news and entertainment forever and to this very day allows us to watch things like angry talking heads yell at each other, your favorite internet personality playing a video game, or 40-minute clown documentaries. The antics of the clown could now be recorded on film for the whole world to enjoy, not just those who were able to afford tickets to Broadway shows or circuses. And there were several performers who would define this era of film, none bigger than Charlie Chaplin. 
To call Charlie Chaplin one of the most influential performers in history would almost be underselling his impact. His life and career is something that could easily be the subject of its own video. But for our purposes, let's take a look at his iconic character, the Little Tramp. The Tramp is without question Chaplin's defining role, a character he would play in numerous films throughout his career and a character that took strong influence from the theater and circus clowns of his day. While he lacked the pale white face paint and red cheeks and lips that the Grimaldi-style clowns featured, his mannerisms were almost entirely the same. A bumbling fool who constantly finds himself in comically bad situations. Chaplin's tramp also evoked the jester tradition of speaking truth to power and providing biting social commentary through the veil of humor. His films often showcased the crushing conditions faced by the working class of the early 20th century, and was very critical of the 1% who got to enjoy a life of luxury off the blood, sweat, and tears of those who worked under them. Like most of the clowns talked about in this video, Chaplin's life was a series of triumphant highs and disastrous lows. His first speaking role, 1940's The Great Dictator, saw him playing a satirical version of Adolf Hitler, with the film's ending featuring a five-minute monologue by Chaplin where he speaks directly to the audience and pleads for mankind to unite in brotherhood and fight for democracy. He goes on to advocate for the tearing down of racial and religious barriers in a desperate plea for a better, more equal world. It is considered one of the greatest movie scenes of all time, and if you want a video really showcasing how its message is still relevant to this day, I would highly recommend the wonderful video Night Docs made on it. At the time of release, though, the speech was much more controversial. There were some with whom the message greatly resonated. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt were huge fans of the film, with the latter even inviting Chaplin to come deliver a radio reading of the speech at his 1941 inauguration. Others, though, were not so impressed. Many lamented the overly political nature of the film, apparently not realizing almost all of Chaplin's work had political undertones, and responded with the 1940 equivalent of Get Woke, Go Broke. Chaplin became an extremely polarizing figure within America for the next two decades, and would eventually be accused of being a communist sympathizer during the Red Scare of the 1950s. Thankfully, Chaplin's reputation would recover before his death, and he averted the tragic end that befell many of his clownish brethren. The clown would continue to enjoy immense popularity for most of the 1900s. Performers like Otto Griebling would keep the tradition alive in the circus, while actors like Red Skelton would keep the clown relevant on the silver screen. Characters like Clarabelle the Clown of the Howdy Doody Show and Bozo the Clown of Bozo's Circus became two of the most popular children's characters on all of television. And three years later, the fast food chain McDonald's would premiere Ronald McDonald, who rapidly became one of the most recognizable mascots in the world. It would seem as though this was the golden age of the clown. The art form was almost universally loved by adults and children. Having a clown appear at your birthday party was the ultimate flex for any baby boomer growing up at the time, and film or television that featured these characters were among the most popular comedic entertainment on Earth. But underneath all this, there was a darkness brewing, one that was easy to ignore with the likes of Charlie Chaplin, Bozo, and Red Skelton entertaining the world, but one that would eventually reveal itself. One of the clown's biggest strengths as a comedic character is the ambiguity that accompanies their silly makeup and exaggerated movements. But it didn't take long for storytellers to realize that for these exact same reasons, the clown could easily be used to induce fear as much as laughter. As the silent film star Lon Chansey once said, there is nothing laughable about a clown in the moonlight. In 1869, author Victor Hugo, best known for his work on The Hunchback of Notre Dame in Les Miserables, wrote a novel entitled The Man Who Laughs. It is the story of an English noble named Gwynplaine, who, as a child, 
is mutilated from cuts across his face that leave him with a permanent grin and exiled from his country. Living on the street, he joins a circus and in order to earn money, shows off his disfigurement in stage shows, where he is mocked and ridiculed by the onlooking crowds. He falls in love with a blind woman named Dee, who, even after feeling the cuts on his face, still loves him. Their story ends in tragedy, though, when Gwynplaine is arrested by the English aristocracy and Dee, believing he has been killed, dies of a broken heart. When Gwynplaine is freed, he returns to find his beloved Dee has died and, overcome with grief, hurls himself into the sea. It was adapted into a film in 1928, and while many of the plot elements, most notably the ending, were changed to give the story a more hopeful feel, the film is widely considered to be one of the first great works of horror. With the dark imagery and bleak atmosphere crafted by director Paul Lenny, being so influential, it would go on to inspire horror films of the coming generation, despite the fact that The Man Who Laughs was not well received on its release. It doesn't take an astute eye to see that Gwynplaine's looks are clearly inspired by the Grimaldi-style circus clown, but meant to be a much more disturbing mirror image. While the character would influence many works of horror over the coming decades, perhaps none are as famous or relevant to our story as the villainous clown he would inspire over at DC Comics, The Joker. The Joker is easily one of the most well-known comic book characters in history, and made his debut in the first issue of Batman published in 1940. Famous for his white makeup and green hair with a purple and orange outfit, the Joker could easily pass for one of the circus clowns of the day. However, as indicated by his nickname, the Clown Prince of Crime, the Joker's motivations were much more nefarious than that of any mere circus clown. A very unhinged and psychotic criminal, the Joker committed a plethora of acts ranging from murder to larceny. In the earliest Batman comics, Joker was portrayed as a merciless killer, regularly murdering bystanders with everything from poison to explosives. However, in the 1950s, comic books saw a backlash from parents and activists, who felt the violence portrayed in their pages was causing juvenile crime to rise. Basically, parents did what they do best and blamed their children's problems on everything but their parenting. Batman, which was a pretty violent comic for the time, was one of the publications that particularly drew this group's ire. As a result, the violence in it was toned down tremendously starting in the 1950s. The entire comic became more campy and childish as to stay on the good side of parents who were forking out the money for their children's comic books. This made the Joker go from a domestic terrorist in clown makeup to a pretty standard clown, who would regularly use joke weapons like pie launchers, hand buzzers, and whoopee cushions. In 1966, a TV show based on the Batman comic debuted starring Adam West and Burt Ward as the dynamic duo. The role of Joker was played by Cesar Romero, who had ironically spent the majority of his career playing a Latin heartthrob on the big screen. Batman would go on to be a major success, defining the careers of many of the actors and actresses who were involved with it. But it was famously campy, perhaps even more so than the comics it drew inspiration from. Romero's Joker was a very silly circus clown, who just happened to be into robbing banks and trolling the caped crusaders. Nothing even remotely close to the murderous psychopath the character would evolve into. While it might not be the darkest portrayal of an evil clown, the Joker of the 1960s would probably be the first real instance of a villainous clown in motion pictures, and certainly the most famous at the time. By the 1970s, comics were going back to their roots and making darker, more violent stories as the generation who'd grown up on the 50s camp was now adults and wanted adult stories. Joker returned to being a sadistic killer who was almost completely out of touch with reality. Coincidentally, this shift back to a darker, more depraved clown prince of crime coincided with the discovery of a real-life monster in the 1970s, 
one who would irrevocably transform the clown forever. John Wayne Gacy was an American serial killer who between the years of 1972 and 1978 murdered at least 33 victims, the majority of which were teenage boys. This was at a time where serial killers were first coming to the attention of the public, particularly in the United States. So Gacy's story would likely have received widespread news coverage anyway. But as fate would have it, Gacy happened to work on the side as a clown. This of course became one of the defining features of Gacy's crime spree. And it cannot be overstated how much Gacy's murders horrified parents in the 1970s. Clowns were still very much icons of children's entertainment, and the idea that one could commit some of the most horrific acts imaginable, then turn right around and show up to perform at a kid's birthday party was unthinkable. As bad as the 2016 sightings were for the clown's reputation, John Wayne Gacy's murder spree was the mortal wound that the clown has slowly been dying from ever since. Almost overnight, portrayals of the clown in media began to change. The bozos and Ronalds of the world were still thriving, and the idea that clowns were more scary than funny hadn't quite become mainstream yet. But the first domino had fallen, and during the late 1980s, there was a distinct shift in the clown's image. This ranged from campy horror films like 1988's Killer Clowns from Outer Space to a possessed clown doll in the film Poltergeist, and of course, Stephen King's 1986 novel It, which introduced Pennywise the Dancing Clown, a shape-shifting monster who fed on people's fear and found children to be the most desirable target as their fears were easy to exploit. The novel was a hit, and a 1990 television miniseries starring Tim Curry as the nightmarish Pennywise became an iconic piece of American horror that is talked about and remade to this very day. The 1980s also saw the Joker's transformation come full circle, with Alan Moore's 1988 graphic novel The Killing Joke. The Killing Joke offered an origin to the Clown Prince of Crime, showing him as an engineer who quits his job to take a shot at being a stand-up comedian, only to fail miserably. Desperate and with a pregnant wife to support, he agrees to take part in a robbery of a chemical plant that goes horribly wrong and ends with him falling into a vat of chemicals that permanently disfigures him. Determined to show Batman that all it takes is one bad day for even the most upstanding person to lose their mind, Joker and his crew show up at Commissioner Gordon's house and kidnap him after Joker shoots Barbara Gordon through the hip, paralyzing her. Joker takes Gordon to a fun house at an abandoned carnival where he psychologically tortures him to try and make him go mad. Most infamously, by displaying photos Joker took of Barbara stripped naked and bleeding after shooting her. Despite his most depraved efforts, Commissioner Gordon doesn't break, and when Batman shows up to save the day at the end, the final scene shows a very poetic exchange between the two characters, establishing that both are mirror images of each other. It has drawn its share of criticism both at the time of its release and in the years since, particularly for its treatment of Barbara. Even Alan Moore himself has been very clear that he doesn't like it all that much. But in all fairness, Alan Moore doesn't really like anything. To Batman fans, and I include myself among this group, it is one of the greatest and most influential stories to take place within the universe, even if some of the subject matter can be uncomfortable to read. It has influenced each subsequent version of the Joker in both comics and on screen taking the character far away from the lovable villain Cesar Romero had been during the Adam West era, and taking him to the dark depths that the original creators likely had envisioned. Except for whatever the hell Jared Leto was supposed to be. We just pretend that never happened. This trend of evil clowns in media continued well into the 90s and 2000s, with characters like the Violator from Spawn, Sweet Tooth from the Twisted Metal series, and Krusty the Clown from The Simpsons, who, while not exactly evil, is clearly far removed from the kid-friendly circus clown pioneered by Joseph Grimaldi. The success of Pennywise 
made the evil clown a popular horror trope, who inspired dozens of similar characters throughout other works of fiction. In 2008, a study conducted by the University of Sheffield concluded that children of the early 2000s found clowns to be more scary than funny. Initially, researchers believed the likely culprit had been pop culture. After all, for the last two decades, the slew of evil and creepy clowns throughout the media had all but drowned out the portrayal of the fun and happy ones. However, they ended up concluding the main culprit was the fact that children viewed them as both frightening and unknowable, with the second part being the one I really want to focus on. If you've ever watched the classic Vsauce video, Why Are Things Creepy?, or are just generally familiar with the Uncanny Valley, you probably see where I'm going with this. Clowns have human features. They have arms, legs, eyes, and all the other parts a normal person has, so our brains should recognize them as familiar. But something is a little off. The makeup, the eyes, the laugh. They're human, but with features that we don't typically associate with other humans. This confuses our brains, as one part of us recognizes them as kin to ourselves, but the other sees them as an unknown potential danger. From the court jester to Joseph Grimaldi, this ambiguity had always allowed the clown to get away with comments and behavior that others would have been placed in a mental ward for, all in the name of humor. But it seems now that the pendulum has swung the other way, where these days clowns are seen as something to be feared. So with that, what's the final verdict? Are clowns funny or are they creepy? Well, that's something you'll have to decide for yourself. What I can tell you is that entertainment as it exists today wouldn't be the same without them, and their legacy within the performing arts is unshakable. So maybe next time you see a clown, stop for just a second to thank them before you decide to run for your life. <laughs>